Good morning, everybody. As people are joining, I'm just going to drop a link <clears throat> to the slides today <clears throat> into the chat because they have some instructions in them. <clears throat> okay, it's 9 a.m. <clears throat> so I'm going to get us get us started here with today's uh, delegate assembly. So as with most assemblies, we split it into two hours. Um, and in the first hour, we're going to be doing a beginner level tutorial um, on the TAP service. That's the table access protocol service. Um, it's the way that we recommend you access the catalogs for data preview zero. And for that, we're going to be using notebook number two from the DP0.2 set of notebooks. It's going to be presented by Douglas Tucker. And then at 10 a.m. for the second hour, instead of doing breakouts, we're going to be doing an intermediate level uh, tutorial session that focuses on the time domain data in particular um, and how you can access it with TAP. So there'll be one portal tutorial pretty quick that's going to show how you can now access images in the portal uh, using the OBSTAP uh, service that'll be presented by Greg. And then Jeff Carlin's going to present Notebook 07B, which shows you how to get variable starlight curves. So you'll be using the TAP service to access the time domain catalogs and making some variable starlight curves. So, that's what's going to happen today. If you're an experienced TAP user, you might want to skip notebook to skip the beginner level one if you've if you've been working with us in DP 0.1. But of course, everyone is welcome um, to stay for book for both for the full two hours or just one of the hours. As always with the delegate assemblies, um, there's a bunch of Ruben staff here today. So if you have trouble sort of at any time, even if the speaker is talking about like something else, you can put those questions into the chat because there's a bunch of us monitoring the chat. Uh, so we can help you with sort of like other stuff on the side, like RSP access, notebook, updating, whatever it is that you need on the side can go in the chat, uh, even while the speaker is talking. So there's no need to like necessarily wait until someone's done talking to ask your question because we have the chat for that. There's a couple of things that I want to go over today. And the, the next couple of messages are mostly for our delegates who are with us for DP0.1, who had the DP0.1 set of notebooks in their home directory. If you've just joined us and just got an account in the RSP, all your notebooks will be fresh and they'll all be for DP0.2 and you don't have to worry. But if you are with us for DP0.1, and your directory in the notebook aspect of the Rubin Science platform, which is the notebook slash tutorial notebooks directory, if it doesn't look like this with this exact list of notebooks, and if notebook number two, if the header doesn't look like it does in this screen, it's probably the old version of notebook two that was for the DP0.1 data set. And it is not gonna be the same as what we're presenting today and it won't work um, on the DP0.2 data set. So, if your particular directory notebook slash tutorial notebooks doesn't look like this, and you're an experienced Git user, you can navigate to this um, web page here that I've got in the slides, what to do if the notebooks do not automatically update. And there are ways to use Git to like healthily update this particular, um, this particular directory, this particular folder. Um, if you're not uh, a strong Git user and you've never done a Git reset and you're not sure what that means, we have another option for you, which is a fast but temporary fix to Git clone the notebooks. Um, oops, I'm trying to copy and paste the link to these slides in for everyone who just joined. There we go. So everyone who just joined should now be able to get a copy of these slides too. Um, if you know what a Git clone is, you can go and grab the entire tutorial notebooks directory for yourself. I'm using this slide, the instructions on this particular slide in the slide deck. If you really aren't a Git user at all and you don't know what a Git clone is, um, then maybe this particular remedy is not for you. But you can also just go download 
the particular notebook that we're going to be using today uh, from the repository in the website and then upload that just that one file into the notebook aspect in your home directory and then just use that. So, so in the slides, which I've put a link to in the chat and which everybody should be able to navigate to, to see. It's if you've been with us for DP 0.1 and you have a problem with the notebooks, there's basically three different solutions depending on your level of comfort uh, with Git and using Git uh, to do like a Git reset, a new Git clone, or to just grab the particular file that we're gonna use today. <clears throat> I'm gonna pause for a second in case there's any questions or in case anyone can't access these slides for these instructions. Okay, so either no one has trouble or no one has managed to log in yet to find out whether they have trouble. <laughs> so if you uh, find that you have trouble sort of over the next couple minutes or literally any time today, pop it in the chat. Um, we'll try and get you sorted as we go. And that's actually all I wanted to, to tell you about today. So uh, let's get started with Douglas and your tutorial for Notebook 02. I'm gonna stop sharing and let you take it away. All right. Oh, uh, thank you, Melissa. Uh, so uh, 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 as M Melissa mentioned, we'll, we'll be going through uh, Notebook 2. Let me share my screen here. Um, so uh, this has a reminder. Of, uh, first of all, people can see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, so here we're on the on the the main page for the Ruben Science platform. It's at data.lsst.cloud, and uh, if you have not already logged in, uh, you'll uh, you'll want to. Um, well, first of all, you'll, you'll want to log in. I've logged in, um, but you want to go to the notebooks aspect. And um, we'll, we'll, uh, what I usually do is I usually op uh, initially open up a terminal just in case I need to have that. Um, you will want to go to uh, where your notebooks directory is. In my case, uh, my it's a little bit different, probably a little bit different from from, uh, from 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 yours, but you'll want to go to where you have your uh, tutorial notebooks. Douglas, could you make the font maybe a little bigger? Oh, okay. Let's see. Yeah, that's more readable. Okay. That's a lot more readable for me. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, I just want to pause briefly. Here are people on this. Uh, people who are uh, following this tutorial. Are you on this page? Or even is anyone not on this page? I should say. Or does anyone need any help? Okay, I'll take that. Oh, uh, okay. So um, it looks like most people are there. If not, send a message on the chat and, and so people will, will be able to answer it and help. Uh, let's say wait, maybe wait another 15, sec 15 or 30 seconds just in case. Yeah, it usually takes a little while to spin up that server. Oh yeah. Especially if we've got almost 50 people trying to do it all at once. So it might take a moment. Yeah. Okay. So okay. So we'll just while uh, while we're waiting for a few seconds, uh uh, uh so uh, let me expand this for the moment. We'll be looking at uh this uh uh notebook two catalog queries with a tap. And uh, I will, so um, I will, uh, so I will actually, I'll start this now. I'll, so you double click it uh, with your, uh, with your, with your mouse and it'll open up 
um, open up your uh, it'll open up that uh, that notebook. So this was originally written by Liang Gai. It has very some very nice uh, 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 very nice things which are uh, not only exploring the tap server, but there's also uh, uh, some intro introduction to uh, to the the Boca uh, plotting database and and pandas. We'll be looking at uh, uh, things. In the we'll be looking at uh, objects force force source uh, the force source catalog and the CCD visit tables, um, and this was originally written for DP zero point one, but it has gone through a lot of uh, updates uh, uh, thanks to the uh, well other members of the <laughs> uh, community engagement team. Uh, so it's it's been has a nice fresh look and and new and 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 it's a little bit uh, as it's a little bit tighterly uh, more tightly uh, described. Um, okay, I, I think we have it. I think everyone's probably at this point. Anyone? Any uh, any problems? No. Okay, let's let's move on. So uh, uh, we'll let's just go down a bit. Uh, so it's uh, so. Um, uh, we are focusing on the the tap server, which is a table access protocol server. Uh, and for those who want to go delve into more deeply into it, there's document. There's a link here to documentation for the tap. And this is developed as part of the Nat, uh, the International Virtual Observatory uh, for accessing tables uh, along broad broad uh, broad platforms. And it use, makes use of uh, what's called the astronomical data query language, or ADQL, which is similar to SQL. And there's also a link to that. Uh, we do have a warning that we don't have, we haven't that uh, that the Ruben team has not implemented all the functionality of ADQ into the current RSP. But uh, but they, but uh, there's a there's a uh, but most of it is there and uh, new functionality is being added uh, as time goes on. Um, so first thing in our first. Uh, Oh no, did I? Oh, drat. I thought I clear, cleared this. Uh, one second while I clear my output so we have a nice clean. Uh, oh, and to clean, uh, and as, as you saw, to, to clear your, if you ever want to clear all your outputs, you can come up to this kernel uh, menu item and restart kernel and clear all outputs. Uh, so, uh, this will be fairly standard for most of the notebooks. You have a package imports area, and many of these are often in many of the other other uh, uh, other notebooks that you'll see. Uh, so we have uh, so people are familiar with uh, uh, Python and, and Jupyter notebooks. Uh, uh, often use NumPy, Matplotlib, Pandas. There's some stuff from the AstroPy uh, package. Uh, a particular testing feature that we'll use much later on in, the, in this notebook on uh, uh, the assert frame equal from the plat, uh, pandas uh, package. Uh, for this particular notebook and other notebooks that use the tap service, we also want to grab something from the LSST RSP uh, package, the get tap service and the retrieve, retrieve query uh, um, uh, sub package. And this, this is not so much in many of the other notebooks, because many of the notebooks tend to use matplotlib for the plotting package, but Boca is a very nice interactive tool uh, uh, combined with holoviews, and we will see a lot of this later on in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the notebook. And then um, there's some warnings that we kind of might want to suppress. We've imported the warnings uh, package and uh, and a uh, and, uh, units warning uh, sub package from Astro units. So what you want to do, if you have not been, uh, uh, done this before, you want to, for to run this shell, you want to do a, a shift return. And this will take a second or two to run. And it loads all those packages into, into memory. Now there's also, uh, we may also want to define some functions. And in this case, uh, uh, we do some stuff to, to 
uh, this is not uh, this first one is not one that you might you, you might not generally use, but for this notebook, we want to uh, set the number of rows returned to the Jupyter notebook onto the Jupyter notebook screen uh, to uh, to twenty. And we also for we also use uh, for Boca, we want to output the results to the notebook, not to a not to a separate uh, PNG frame. And we also want to kind of filter out some basic uh, basic warnings, not to clutter up our uh, our notebook. So once again, you want to do a, a re shift return, and you see that the Boca uh, JavaScript package is successfully loaded. Um, and there's another another useful another useful um, of uh, uh, um, routine that uh, Python routine that we that uh, that uh, is included here when you query a database uh, a, a aq uh, adq database you don't the things returned are not always in the same order uh, it's kind of randomized so you may want to sort things uh, you might want to have uh sort your, your the resulting uh, result table uh by one of the variables one of the columns so here's a a useful uh, um, uh, thing to uh, useful routine to sort your results using uh, pandas data frames to to sort sort and uh, reset the index to the to the data frame. And you once again want to do shift return. Okay, now we get to the uh, to the to more of the meat of the notebook. We want to first establish our uh, we want to establish our um, uh, a connection to the database, and we use uh, uh, from the LSST RSP package this git tap service um, uh, command, and then we also want to just double check that everything is working. So we so we want to assert that we actually get a return a return value for that, and that the URL is actually pointing to the uh, to our DP zero. Uh, uh, tap uh, tap server. So we hit that, and we don't get re anything returned. So that's good. You might also check uh, if this asserts working by hitting by adding an extraneous uh, character here. Oh no! Okay, <laughs> so it's uh, that that shows that okay there was an error. So we uh, in the assertion, but we return it. Hit shift return, and okay everything is nice and uh clean uh okay we have now we have access to the tap so we want to see what is in the what is available and there's different levels the top level is we want to look what what tap schemas are available and you can you can um uh see uh find a little more information what's in the ruben tap schema through the dp0 documentation and there's a link here uh but we can also run a tap uh, in ADQL query to get uh, to uh, uh, directly from the notebook. So once again, we highlight the cell and we uh, do a shift enter and it says it's, uh, and it, it, it's uh, returned uh, a, uh, the, the tap results, but we want to be able to see what's in there. So we, uh, uh use this uh, service search query and we create and we uh use this dot two table that accesses the astropy routine uh to make it astropy tables you can also uh and then this this result will actually this 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 line will actually then return this results to the screen so if you hit shift return you get a nice a list of what schemas are in the tap server um and uh um actually i want to do a short break a very short break here just to make sure uh, anyone having problems people are keeping up okay if you are having problems uh yet yeah, please go to please uh uh, send something in the chat window, and someone will 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 will, will be there to help. Uh, okay, so uh, so we get results. Of what's what schemas are available? Uh, 
So uh, there is a, sort of a leg legacy uh, uh, schema for DP 0.1. Uh, so this has five tables uh, based upon the initial processing using an older version of the Rubin uh, uh, data management software uh, and converted into uh, uh, to a modern uh, 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 a butler, uh, which we'll not talk about so much in this, this notebook, but later on. Uh, and then we, there was a recent reprocessing of all the all, all these simulated data using the, uh, a, 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 a more modern version of the the most modern version of the data management stack. Uh, the code is a data PP zero point two. This is the one that we're concerned about here, and this uh, uh, includes several tables. Several tables. That beyond what was in uh, DP 0 0.1. And then we also have a, a link when we talk, uh, when we when I think uh, uh, later in the hour, uh, there'll be some talk of, uh, I think of OBSTAP. Obstap. Uh, there's uh, stuff there. And then there's some material which you don't, we don't really care about it. I think it's, it's mostly for uh, 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 running the tap service. So we, we aren't so concerned about that. Uh, as users. Um, okay, so we, that was the top level. Let's actually look into, um, we wanna look at, at DP zero, the DP0 DC2 catalogs uh, schema. Uh, so um, there's often lots of material in, 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 a, in a schema. And so you might want, so uh, here we, we want to, Okay, actually, in a schema or in a table. So, actually, we're gonna sort of repeating this. We have we've grabbed uh, the results. Uh, this basically just looks for if you had a really long list above here and don't want to have to search. It's DP zero two. You can do that here, and you'll uh, you it basically loops through the a list of schema names to find something that has that has the string DP zero two on it. And it prints it out. Basically, that's just what we saw here. Uh, now we can explore this uh, this DP zero DC two catalog, uh, catalog schema uh, by querying it. And so this is using the ADQL language. It's similar to SQL. Uh, here we uh, select from the table. Uh, we select from tap schema tables. So we actually, we are actually in this case, we are using this tap schema, this tap schema here. Uh, so we're looping through, we're, we're selecting from tap schema tables, see what tables are available. And we are interested in, uh, in uh, the schema, the DP, the DP02 DC2 schema. And we'll also order it by the, we'll, we'll return the return uh, we'll order the output. Uh, so it's ordered by a, a table index. So this will, this defines the query. We print the query out to the screen and then we uh, run the query and output it to an AstroPy table. And then we out, then, uh, we, uh, then we uh, print the, the results to the screen. And so here's the full query. It's basically this with, uh, it's basically this with uh, DP zero DC two attached. Oh, uh, and then here are the results. So we have five. Oh, well, no, we have nine tables. <laughs> we have nine tables. We had I think we had five for DP zero one. So uh, this gives a description of the table. The name, the 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 schema name, of uh, the index in the in the in the tap schema table in the, uh, table, and then the name of the table. So we have the object table, the source table, the first source table, the DIA or DIA object table, the DIA source table, the visit table. The CCD visit table and the coad patches table, and uh, 
we are interested in in this this in this uh, uh, tutorial about the object table, which includes the properties of the the objects that's uh, in uh, objects uh, detected and measured on the on the deep coat images. Uh, the forest source table, in which forest photometry you basically know where the object is, and you from previous from, from the coad say, and then then you uh, and, uh, and then you basically uh, you know the location, and you, and you use that to examine photometry in that area based upon uh, uh, either the coad or another filter. Uh, so here, the forest source photometry on individual single epoch images uh, and difference images based on and linked on to entries in the object table, which is co deep coad based uh, point source PSF photometry is uh, performed based on the coordinates from a reference band chosen for each object and reported in the object ref band column. And I believe we also are looking at the CCD visit table which basically tells you, uh, uh, gives you metadata about each of the 189 CCDs for each visit or each pointing uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the DC2 simulated survey. Uh, and uh, here there's some definitions. Uh, that we maybe we won't go into too much detail here, but you have the schema. That's the that's uh, the abstract design describing the storage of the data in the database. The tap schema, which is the specific schema describing the tap service. Uh, the table collection, which is the collection of tables, and we are focused on DP zero DC two catalogs. And a table is a collection of. Uh, uh, data uh, data held in table format in the database. For instance, uh, with an EP zero DC two catalogs collection, there is the dot object table, and then uh, results are the re result of running the query. Uh, so that TapSource returns that as a tap results object, and uh, and you extract it or or pot the screen through additional methods. All right. Um, uh, just a quick, just a very quick stop. Any any questions at this point? Okay. And if you do have questions, uh, as as before, uh, uh, if you relate relate them to the chat, someone will, will will be able to answer you. Okay. Now we've we got to the point of we've looked at the schema. We've looked at the 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 the. Of uh, uh, we looked at the tax we looked at the DC DP02, what's in the DP02 uh, DC2 catalog uh, schema. Now let's actually look at some data. Uh, uh, so we look at the object catalog, which contains the information on objects detected in the coad images, which are also known as stacked, we could also be computer stacked or combined images. So first thing is you want to look at what tables there are, but this is uh, well, what columns there are on this table. But this 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 table in particular has a lot of columns. It has a 990 columns. Uh, we, they won't all show up here uh, because of uh, uh, not only defaults in the Jupyter server, but also we we gave a we also limited the number. I believe we limited the number of this, the limit that we gave to pandas was nine was 20 entries to be returned. So uh, up to uh, actually here's just showing up to uh, sh showing uh, about ten at ten. So so uh, the first few columns, then it doesn't show everything uh, to the screen, and then there's uh, additional up to uh, row nine ninety. So there's uh, if you include index, it's this index zero as zero indexed as Python and C and other modern languages. Uh, do it's, so it's not 991 columns uh, rows and we have four columns you have the well we have the index which is counted, the column name the data type a description and the units if anything now we don't uh now there's actually a link to 
describing all these things in the DP0 documentation, so we won't go into the details. But let's say we want to search for uh, a column name that had chord in it, and we can make use of uh, this little, uh, the, uh, we can search for the string chord, we can look to the results in the column name uh, um, column. And when we find something that finds that, we can print it out. And we find there's scored deck and there's scored RA. Now with dealing with uh, these query results, it's often good to, to clean up if, uh, if you uh, don't need those particular results anymore because it takes up space. Here it's not too big, too bad, but if you're uh, downloading hundreds of thousands of objects or something, and there you think you, you may want to do occasional uh, delete of the results. Um, and, and, uh, and, that's, and that's it. So uh, for this part, uh, now I'll, I think um, I'll leave, okay, I'll, I'll, uh, okay, there is an exercise for the learner. I think maybe I'll just kind of continue on since I'm a little slow at this. Uh, people can go back to it as a simple example. You can just come back over here, change your search uh, search string, and look for things that have flux. And you'll find that I did something wrong. And what should I do wrong? Oh, because I deleted it. <laughs> I wonder, let's see, rerun that. So if you delete it, you cannot query it. So okay, there's a lot of there's lots of fluxes, lot of types of fluxes in, uh, and there's a lot there's a lot lot of fluxes. <laughs> uh, and once again, let's clean that up before moving on. And and if you want to play around later, you can you can search for other things. Uh, let's move on. You can do also do cone searches. I look for a part of the sky. Of a rate, uh, look for all the objects within a radius. Uh, 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 look for all, all, all the objects within a certain radius of a point on the sky. Uh, so here we'll we'll uh, sense uh, the data sense the simulated data that we're using with is only three hundred square degrees. We don't we, can't, we don't want to just choose anything at purely at random because we only have a small piece of sky that's simulated and, and processed. So we'll aim at the center of uh, the, the simulated data set, which is at an RA of 62 degrees and a deck of minus 37 degrees. And we'll do a search radius of one degree. And although not strictly necessary here, you can uh, create a sky current in the in a particular frame in the, in, with units of degrees here. Now, actually, the cap query doesn't really necessarily want the astro pi variation of this, but uh, just the but just the simple uh, a simple uh, a, a text uh, uh, value. Uh, so we'll use this later on. Um, now, we are talking about a fair amount of data often in these queries. You may want to limit how many you return uh, from your query. Here we uh, so here we show how to just return the top five. And so we, there's a couple of different methods you can, uh, and we'll look at both of these. One, one method is to use uh, the, the top option in your query uh, directly in your query, or when you're returning results, you can tell it just to return a max, maximum number of records or, or rows. So we will save this for later on. And first we will uh, take a look at the using, uh, using the top option. Uh, so below, we build a query to find bright objects with magnitude less than 18 and extending this equals zero. So we're looking for stars uh, in the R band. Uh, extended as equals one would be a, for a galaxy, uh, something fuzzy. Uh, and uh, as mentioned in previous notebooks, uh, we want to use detect is primary equals true, which means that the source, when the detector 
uh, goes to it, it finds sources, then it tends it may break things up into children objects from parent to children. Uh, if there are, if, if there's uh, any blended objects. So you just only want to return the, uh, so uh, you want to just find the things which are detected, which are, uh, which have no, I uh, uh, have no uh, deblended children to avoid returning both deblended and blended objects. Um, there is a warning about using top and order by, uh, and that uh, top, uh, so you, the, when you do ordering, uh, that takes precedence. So it'll try to do, you ret return a, a billion objects and it'll try to order all those by whatever row that you want. And then it'll take the top five that doesn't really save you any time. Uh, in this particular case, we use a where clause to limit the number of objects that are returned. So where, where clause takes precedence. Uh, so whatever is returned by the where clause will then be ordered and then it only return the top. Uh, the top uh, objects here. So here we use this top here to, to limit the, to the number of records to five. And so uh, we do that. We run this. It takes a few seconds. Um, and uh, uh, we uh, uh, we don't actually we don't actually return anything to the to the screen. We just will do an assert that we are only returning five objects and there's no error. So that's good. So we'll continue and look at the other method of returning just a limited number of objects. Uh, we uh, set using the, the setting max rec in the, in the results return uh, command. So here it's exactly the same, except no top here. We select every, uh, but uh, when we do the query, do the search query, we define the maximum records to be max references. So it's, we define it to be five. And once again, we run that. It takes about five ish seconds to run. Um, or a little bit longer. <laughs> Since we're, uh, uh, yeah, so we were all running this at the same time, it took 15 seconds. Uh, and then we can uh, use. Recall that we 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 uh, we uh, 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 we uh, in the um, recall when we were importing packages, we imported this assert frame equals. And that's and this is where we use it. this is the one place and the one place we use that. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Basically, so we and we also that sort frame uh, thing to sort the, the the sort the results too. So this is basically uh, this is just a test to make sure that the results from doing the top versus the results using the max rec method uh, are the same. Uh, so we run that, no errors. That's good. And then we could actually even just take a quick take a quick look at the two uh, the two tables as returned by using top or max rec. And so here was using top. So object ID, RE and deck, uh, whether there's C model flux and G band, uh, the value of the R band C model flux, extendedness, whether it's a star zero or galaxy one. Uh, and uh, oh, I don't quite remember that what that what our input count means. Uh, but we can always look later. But we won't do it here because we have limited time. Uh, so let's move on and let's see. So and then we just do a spot check, looking my eye. Yes, the two different results are the, are identical. And then uh, once again, you may want to delete the results. Not so strictly necessary here because we only have a few. We only have like five results here, uh, but uh, not. It's a it's a good practice. Now, a more detailed query. You want to query two tables from the BP zero uh, schema and join join them uh, using a the this ADQL query. So uh, we're uh, looking for bright non-extended objects basically stars or quasars, 
in the one degree radius. And now we join with the force, force source table to obtain some PSF photometry from the R band process image visits, the seal epoch visits. And join, and we will join that with the CCD visit table to obtain uh, the dates, the times when these when when these observations were taken. Uh, here we're not we're not setting the maximum record because we're, gonna, uh, we're not setting the uh, maximum records. We're going to get basically all the data, and we actually in this case we don't care about ordering, so we remove we don't use an order by statement in this this uh, in, in this case. This query usually takes under ten seconds. So when people are ready, to uh, hit shift return. Oh, only two seconds, and then we can uh, we can return the results. Uh, so the result, results to an AstroPy table, and then we can convert it to a pandas table. You could also just do it to an uh, Astro. You could also just remove two pandas if you're not interested in the pan, pandas variation. But uh, so here we go. We have the forest source ID, the object ID, the CC visit ID. Uh, it, we made sure that it was uh, uh, not a uh, that this object did not this detection did not have any uh, children. It's all in R band. We have a PSF magnitude, uh, and we have the uh, the 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 start time the observation for that for that uh, particular uh, uh, visit that to that part of that sky, and uh, we have a. Uh, uh, not only the not only the individual detection PSF, uh, but also from the from the from the uh, from the from the coad. Uh, I didn't, so you know, so the coad they're all the same because these all went into the coad. The uh, images from here all went into the coad. These all be the same. These are different. Um, let's see. Let's let's move on. Uh, we can. Uh, Look at how many unique objects were returned, and uh, so that's from the coad, and the distribution of number of of uh, four four sources or the visit images that went into that object. So uh, here we uh, use a NumPy routine to find the number of unique objects, and we also count how many uh, forced. And we, we also return the the. The counts from from the number of uh, number of rows returned for each object ID because the ob object ID will be the same. Uh, we don't, yeah. So you'll see here also the object ID is the same for all these four sources. Or so we're looking for each object. We're getting the object ID. We're finding how many four source IDs there are, and that's what we're doing in this using the NumPy unique routine. And we're trying not only we're, we're trying not only the the object IDs but the counts. And then we will create a histogram using, in this case, we're using matplotlib. And so here we see, uh, 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 so for uh, that, uh, uh, we're getting about a hundred-ish, hundred and ten-ish uh, number of visits or number of four sources per uh, per uh, per per. Per object from the coad. Let's see. Oh, let's see. We had a. Uh, let's see. Louise has a question. Is our input count the number of individual sources that go into the coad? Uh, that sounds. That maybe that that sounds right, but maybe one of the. Yeah, I'll double check it in the schema. I think that is what it is. But I'll okay. double check. Yeah. Okay. Th thanks, Melissa. All right. Let's, uh, so, um, okay. Um, now, joins are kind of hard. There's there's different types of joins. We won't go into that detail here. That's uh, uh, but there's many sources uh, for learning how to do joins using SQL or ADQL. And in this case, Google Search and Stack Overflow is your friend. Uh, 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 so we'll go into detail here, um, but let's see. Uh, okay, the next step. Okay, we'll we'll plot the time series. So we for for one of the objects. So we'll take the the first uh, object ID from the list. So we so we have a 
yeah, so we returned the number of, so in the previous uh, cell, we we had a list of the unique object IDs. We take the, uh, the zero indexed, uh, the zeroth object in that list. And, uh, and then from the, then we query the, we use NumPy, we use the NumPy, a NumPy query where we, we look through the results table and we find uh, uh, those, uh, only those things from that particular object ID. And then we use some matplotlib routines. I won't go into detail here, but we'll use some matplotlib routines to, to show uh, all the all the, all the R band magnitudes over over. So it's basically it's a it's a it's a uh, a light curve for this object. So the so the line is what we what was the measurement from using the just the deep coad, and then the the individual points are the individual from each individual visit uh, uh, using the force source routines. Uh, so. Uh, I don't think this is necessarily a variable. This is just maybe Poisson statistics. Uh, uh, I don't see any particular pat, uh, pattern here other than the than the uh, typical. And let's see. I guess that's. I don't know. It seems a little bit a little bit wider. Maybe maybe it is a variable. It has some variability in there. It seems a bit wider than you'd expect for it. 17th magnitude object in uh, the single visits. But uh, this is a good way to plot uh, light curves for, for variables. Uh, okay, we'll clean up. Uh, here is another way of querying that we'll, we'll skip over that because we don't have too much time. People may want to investigate that on their own. But now we're going to get into, the, uh, into to looking at BOCA, which is a really nice, a really great way of uh, visual, visual, visualizing large data set. So it's a combination of Boca and hollow views and there's documentation for that. Uh, we let's uh, uh, query uh, objects. So the, these are from the coad uh, within a within that's within that, that central search area and we'll look at things between 17th and 23rd magnitude. Hey Douglas. Oh yes. I want to warn you you have about 10 minutes. Yeah yeah I see it's uh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, so we'll, yeah, so we'll go fairly quickly through here, and people can uh, review this later on their own. Uh, so we're looking. So uh, uh, we will uh, run this query to get uh, 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 to get these uh, uh, objects with the, uh, uh, the R between seventeen and twenty three, and which are. Uh, uh, and we'll include uh, both galaxies and, and, and point sources, but we'll ignore things which we don't have a good extended parameter. And one thing to mention here, some of these fluxes are get, some of the, some of these uh, that, uh, fluxes do not have corresponding uh, magnitudes. So there is a, uh, there is a uh, routine uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the database for converting, Nanojanskis, which in, uh, which is what the fluxes are measured in, to AB magnitudes, and that can come useful later on. I won't describe this in much detail. I'll just uh, run it, so we can move on, and uh, we'll look at the results, uh, which have been converted into a pandas data frame. And so, oh, it's still running here. <laughs> Uh, so we'll see how long that takes, uh, and we'll twiddle thumbs. Uh, oh no! Oh, here we go. Oh yeah, it took three seconds. Uh, so we have the object ID. It's a primary. It's empty children. We have the R and deck, and we have uh, G, R, and I. Uh, Magnitudes, model man, model magnitudes, uh, and we have an extended extended parameter. Looks like the ones that are shown here are are galaxies. They have an extended of one. Uh, and then now we want to uh, plot these up using using Boca and Holoview. And so uh, 
we will uh, remember we want to look at that. Well, uh, let's see. We'll kind of so uh, bokeh is based on data, and so there's a uh, uh, so we create what's called a column data source from the data uh, that was returned by the query above, and that can be passed to Boca. And this uh, column data source is basically the core of the Boca plots. Uh, Boca automatically creates this uh, one of these uh, column data sources from data past its Python lists or NumPy arrays. And uh, but we need to prepare the data a bit before we get to uh, visualizations. So first of all, we just we, we want to make sure we uh, we want to grab the center coordinates that we defined earlier. This RA sixty two deck minus thirty seven. So you might just run that uh, that we saved earlier uh, in center chords uh, using that sky chord uh, method earlier. And then we want to create a Python dictionary uh, or uh, or map. It's associated with R extendedness. So, uh, uh, so stars have a extendedness of zero, galaxies of one. Uh, doo -doo -doo. And then we want a Python dictionary, which we create using the Python dict command of RA deck, uh, the difference between the RA, object RA and the center RA, and the center and the object deck and the center of the field of view deck and the and the color magnitudes and colors and we create we define we we uh create the python array and we stick it into the column data source book a column data source method to create a, a uh, cds source and then we can also add additional stuff like object id and our extendedness using the from the results table so i'll just run that and then uh then we go from. Then we can uh, uh, we can uh, 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 add these uh, object type into the map using this. Oh, and then we should look at it. So you see, he yeah, had a lot of galaxies here. Uh, Forty almost forty six thousand objects. Now comes the great part: how to color magnitude diagram. And I will just uh, there's different plot options you can ha hand over to Boca. Uh, and then there's something called a hover to tool where you can mouse over things and it'll give you information from the from the from the results table or from the from the uh, CDS. Uh, so we'll grab uh, so we'll grab the G minus I color and the GRI magnitudes and the type and we'll create a hover tool. And then we will do a, we'll create a color magnitude diagram and we'll code things differently for galaxy extended objects and not in point sources. Uh, then we define a palette. Uh, so we'll make some things dark red and other things light gray. Uh, I will not, since we're kind of running out of time, I will just run this and then show the interactive plot, which is really nice. Uh, okay, so here is the interactive plot, G versus G minus I. Uh, you can use your mouse and hover over these objects. You see the little uh, uh, cursor, and you can click on it, and you can see what the color, oh, uh, the color, ah, it's not behaving for me. <laughs> Let's go to this guy. It was that one, the guy was behaving. Okay, gives you the color, the magnitudes, the type as you defined before. The gray objects are galaxies. The star, star, stars are red. Uh, 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 we define things in, uh, 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 of our uh, between 17 and 23. And so this cut is due to the different colors of objects for our band of uh, uh, R band cut of 17. Now you can do nifty things here. You can uh, uh, use this to, uh, as well, use this to, uh, we were basically using this already to look at objects. 
you have multiple objects, so I'll show multiple objects. You can grab a section of area. Oops, can you? Come here. I thought you could. Oh, yes, I did grab a section of area. Now it's okay. Let's, uh, let's go back to the internet there. Let's see. Uh, you have different options for selecting subsets. Um, which I'm not going to. Oh, yeah, you can see the subset being, uh, uh, being highlighted there. Uh, you can make you can add comments. Oh, I thought you could. Okay. I, I'll, I'll do the time. I will. Oh, no. Back there. Uh, oh, uh, due to time, I want to just do a quick thing of wind retrieve link plots, and I won't describe this. I'll just run through these, and so we can just uh, take a look at the plots. And it creates three plots, which are linked, which is very nice. Oh, okay, here we are. Ah. Here I'm going to reduce the screen size so I can see them all together. Okay, so you can do similar things. If you say, what is this object? You can click on it and it shows up in red in the other plots. So uh, it's off to the, uh, okay, it's Elizabeth, it's over here uh, in, uh, on the, on the, Spatial plot. Uh, and it's uh, very in the G minus R uh, color magnitude diagram. Uh, it's uh, off to the, it's one of the bluest stars. Uh, and then, of course, you see where it is here. And you can do it also the other way you can click on, on this guy and it will, will show up. Unless it's overplotted in. Uh, okay, I don't see it on the. Oh, it's at the tip of the blue tip of the color color diagram, and it's off uh, in the bottom left of the of the diagram. And you can uh, not any much luck with this, but you can. Uh, oh, uh, not today, but <laughs> you can gather sections of data. Uh, you can uh, create a, uh, sub data sets uh, also. Uh, okay, oh, we have two minutes ago. I also want to mention just very quickly, and we uh, we did what we were doing, had, what we had been doing was uh, synchronous queries to the TAP server. If you have pretty long queries, you may want to do what's an asynchronous query, which you basically tell the TAP server, I want this data, you can go grab a cup, cup of coffee, come back, see if it's returned a result, and then you can grab, and then you can download it from there. Uh, I will just, uh, just run through this. Here it gives a, an example query. It runs, I, oh, it's, this takes, with, uh, I'll just, yeah, I will, I probably should not run it because it takes longer than, than that time I have left, but I'll basically just kind of run through this. It basically, you uh, create a job, you run the job, uh, and uh, and you tell it to, uh, you, you basically, you can tell your Python cell if you want to wait until the, till it either completes or is an error and then you can fetch the results, uh, and it should be the same as that. As the as since so we use the same query, it should be the the length of the results should be the same in either case. Although, it may be that you might get different results because it's kind of a random process of what's returned. Or, oh no, I guess in the sense it is actually okay. And then you should probably also when you do an asynchronous query when you're finished with it, you should delete the job. And uh, I will leave it at that. Any questions?
questions or comments? Uh, uh, it's a it's a very it's a very it is a very nice notebook. Uh, uh, a lot of people put effort into it. I think it adds a lot of nifty things, especially with the tap server and the and, and the Boca stuff. And I really do not give justice to the Boca stuff. So please play around on your own. Yeah, thank you, Douglas. Round of applause for, for Douglas. Um, and for users, yeah, if you did really like the whole of views and bouquet, then you might like to move on to notebooks number six from here. I think specifically 6B mm -hmm. um, really digs into like using data shader and, and obtaining huge data sets uh, via tap and plotting them, which we'll cover in a future assembly, but if you're excited by what you learned from Douglas, uh, I think 06, the notebooks 06 are your next stop. So we'll continue to take questions in the chat about notebook 02. Maybe you're gonna stick around, fiddle with notebook 02 while we move on to the intermediate level tutorials. That's totally fine. We'll take questions at any time. Um, if you're looking for like to up your game a little bit, I put a little exercise for the learner into the chat um, of how to add error bars to the plot that you made in section 3.3. Um, if you are you know, playing around with things and you wanna have some fun, you can <laughs> add, add error bars for fun. Um, and otherwise, I think we're going to shift um, into our second hour and to our intermediate level tutorials. And so if people are just joining for the second hour, or maybe you're just staying um, to learn more. I did want to reiterate the advice that I gave at the start about if you were if you were here from DP 0.1 and you used the DP 0.1 notebooks um, that were originally in your notebook slash tutorial notebooks directory. We've updated all of the notebooks. This is what it should look like now. So you should have this particular list with these numbers and these names um, in there. In the next hour, we're gonna actually start with a portal tutorial from Greg. Um, so there is a little bit of time to try some of these methods to update um, your, your notebooks directory if need be. Where'd my chat go? I'm gonna put the link to the slides back, back in the chat. If you are having any troubles with the notebooks, we're gonna be using notebook 07B after Greg gives us portal tutorial, Jeff will present notebook 07B. Um, so you can either use Git to update your notebooks directory. You can get a new version of it if you're familiar with Git clone or in the slides, we have instructions on how to just grab the single file that just that one notebook that we're gonna be using it. You can download it to your local computer and then upload it to your home directory in the Rubin Science platform. Um, so those are the three options all in the slides that are in the chat in case you're having any troubles at all with your notebooks. And if you are still having trouble or you, any questions about um, how to get that notebook for the tutorial, just uh, reach out in the chat and we'll do our best to get you set up. So with that, I think I'm going to stop sharing. And Greg is here. And so the first 20, 25 minutes or so, we're going to be looking at portal tutorial number three. So Greg, you'll show them how to log into the portal and also where to find. I'll put the link in the chat um, for us to the tutorial itself. All right, thank you very much, Melissa. This is really great. I'm Greg Madejski, and let me start sharing my screen. Um, I just wanted to tell you that I will be actually building up a little bit on the um, beginner tutorial that Melissa presented last time, and was a beginner tutorial uh, that had to do with plotting the light curve of a supernova. So what I will do is uh, I will actually use the same um, Rubin um, Science Platforms uh, um, uh, instance of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of, the, of the portal itself um, to, to show you how to uh, display an image of a supernova. So um, just before I continue with the, uh, uh, with the image display, maybe I should uh, um, alert you that you have an, one additional 
uh, suggestion for the learners is to add the uh, error bars into light curve. It is the same uh, tutorial, the second one that Melissa presented last time, but now we expanded it during the last few weeks to make sure that uh, you can actually play with it and, uh, and, and do something, uh, uh, something different than you've done so far. All right, so let me now go um, to uh, the uh, main theme today. Um, and um, this will be again the uh, viewing of the Supernova 1A host galaxy. Uh, this is the landing page. When you go into um, Ruben Science Platform and then you click onto the portal aspect, you will get onto this page. This is not the one that we're going to be using today. Instead, you need to click on something that says image search. Okay, and this is going to be uh, Dad, we're not seeing the right screen. We're seeing a results view. Oh, I'm sorry. So let me thank you very much for, for, for pointing it out. Let me just close, stop sharing this one and let me start sharing again. And this will be my, uh, I didn't realize that uh, it is the case. So let me just go on to this one. Okay, so now uh, do you see the correct screen now, Melissa? Good, thank now you. Search, yeah. Excellent, excellent. So one thing that you need to do, and if you want to follow through, uh, you can open the uh, um, in uh, the uh, in in what you what you probably have uh, somewhere is the uh, basically the aspect of the uh, um, in the in in your um, delegate uh, documentation. Basically, I'm going to be following this uh, view supernova one uh, a host galaxy. So uh, let me just continue here. Uh, so the first thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that you have the data product be set up as image, uh, and then you want to have a calibration level number three, which basically um, it is uh, uh, derived. It, it's for derived images such as deep coats and difference images, uh, and leave other options to their default uh, default settings except for the data product subtype. And I'm going to uh, just be. Um, cheating a little bit, I'm going to copy it. And again, I'm going to paste it into my other window. Uh, and that now you can see that they type this lsst.deepcoat underscore calyx, which basically means that this is going to be a, a deep coad of the image of the region where the supernova actually took place. As far as the coordinates are concerned, you have to put the number. Again, I'm going to cheat here and cut and paste from the uh, um, from the uh, uh, information that uh, that Melissa has provided in the uh, uh, in the write up here, I'm going to just copy this and uh, paste it into my other window. Again, this is just sorry. Let me just type it directly in, and this is sixty seven four five seven nine. Um, and the proper syntax requires a comma and minus 44.0802. Okay. The comma is not required. In fact, it's pretty flexible. Oh, okay, thank you. I didn't know that. That's great. Okay, and again, uh, I'm going to... And you need to change the query type menu. That That's a pending fix. Um, yep, right, right below location. Okay. That needs to... The, uh, that, that one, uh, yeah. okay. you change it Thank to you. point. Point, yeah. okay. Yeah, we're we're uh, we're fixing that. That's a limitation in the backend database um, that only supports that one type of query right now. Uh, okay, great. So um, in that case, uh, I should be all set, and I think at this point I will hit search, and this is off to background. Hopefully, we'll come back soon. And indeed, what you're getting here is the um, return of the uh, of one image. Of course, there's more than one image. There are six separate images here. So what we're going to do is now um, we're going to um, to click on, sorry, I don't know why this is showing up, on, uh, um, on image table. Okay, and that basically is that's one image. However, uh, you definitely have, more than one image here. There's six separate ones here. So I'm going to click on this little icon um, 
that you can see here. And now you will see six separate images. There's it's a grid, basically full grid of all the images. Now the data are still loading, so uh, um, I'm going to basically, um, yeah, it's processing the images, and, and hopefully they will all appear properly here. So those are six images. Notice that there are different filters here. Um, the LSST band is listed in this uh, in this one of those those, those vertical uh, nodes here. Uh, so now what we want to do is we want to play with them. And um, the next thing that we want to do is we would like to uh, um, to log those all of those images to the uh, world um, coordinate system. So you click on the uh, here on the uh, align button, and this will be uh, those are very nice, by the way. Uh, uh, very nice little. Uh, uh, tools here and uh, I think that you uh, align it by basically uh, go to log in Im images and I believe that this is the right one it's the next one it's uh, the one that's showing unlocked uh, right now this one this one right yeah, that's the one okay so thank you very much Gregory for being here and now I'm going to uh, log uh, align and log by WCX Okay, and now what that allows me to do is when I slide around in one image, all of them are locked to the same um, to, to to whichever one I'm, I'm sliding on. Okay, so that's very convenient. So uh, uh, this is for both zooming and for panning. So now uh, the next thing is you want to mark the center, uh, mark and center the supernova one A, and you choose the center icon, which again is the uh, I think this this is the one, if I remember correctly, right? And here in a drop down, we're going to center on the um, coordinates of the supernova. Again, 65.4579. Uh, uh, minus 44.0802. Okay. And we're going to go and click and uh, go and mark. Okay. And uh, then we're going to click on the magnifying glass with a little plus here. This is the magnifying glass, and I can actually continue doing this. And I'm not quite sure why is it. I that what that looks like is that the point was not actually in the inside the image. If it's giving you that recenter button, it means you asked it to go to someplace outside the boundaries of the image. Okay, so so maybe we should check the coordinates that um, got typed there. Okay, so the coordinates that got typed. Were... If you just want to reset everything. You can just click recenter on 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 one of those images, and okay, and we can start over here trying to see okay. where they. Okay, so now if we go to um, to this guy center on. So you think that this was well, I'm just I'm let's just be sure we're in the in the frame of um yeah okay. minus 44.0802 and that's correct, right? So let's go and mark. That sounds more, uh, that looks more successful. I see six marks there. Okay, excellent. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to try to zoom in. And the way we'll do this is basically by clicking on this little magnifying glass that you have here and clicking on the plus. Okay, and indeed, thank you very much, Gregory, for pointing this out. And we're zooming in on the, uh, uh, again, on the uh, uh, galaxy where their supernova is. And, uh, you can see that uh, again. I'm continuing to to zoom in, and maybe one more. So this is basically a sorry. That that's where your mark is. Um, so yeah. Also note when you're hovering over one of the images, there's a zoom icon right on the image, so you don't oh, okay, always have great. to go up to that menu. It's usually much more convenient to use those buttons. So I wonder what happened because I thought I was near a near galaxy. I moved to a different location. So yeah, it's definitely not the supernova location anymore. That's right. So let me just go back and and redo this. Uh, 
again, center on, and again on my location 67.4579. Okay, go and mark. Okay, that's better. So now I can, uh, I can actually continue. Huh, that's interesting. Why does that happen? Well, that happens for me too, actually. If I use the little magnifying glass that comes if I hover over, but if I use the magnifying glass up at the top, it zoomed right in on the on the mark. Weird, maybe a, a little bug. Uh, so let me do this. We can try to look at that um, afterwards. I'll see if that's something reproducible, and I can I can look into that. Yeah, yeah, I just did reproduce it. Um, I had the same problem yesterday, and I didn't really quite understand. That's one of the reasons why I kept on doing just this. Okay, so anyway, let me just do it in a in a slow way. Apologies for that, but you will see very soon that this is indeed indeed a, a very nice way to see the. Uh, uh, the, the galaxy itself, but you can clearly see that there is an extension of the uh, of the object that this is not anywhere near compact as some of the stars that you see in a field. But uh, we'll play around with the stretch of the image uh, such that you can uh, um, you can uh, uh, you can actually see the the, the 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 clear extent of or clear location where the supernova is. And the way you uh, you do this is uh, you can. Uh, Use the scale icon, which I believe this scale is this one, right? You can do a color stretch. And uh, I think the recommendation here is to do uh, the log and do it from one to say uh, lower range, 1% uh, to say 99.5%. Okay. Yeah, you can see that the uh, um, that definitely uh, did happen. I'm not quite sure why is it that this some of the images have different granularity in them, but uh, yeah, okay. I think it's just a matter of of, uh, of the of time. And uh, so your cult, you have the other lock that you accidentally unlocked earlier, the color lock. That's why they didn't all change. It's the it's the other button this one there are two lock buttons to the right end of the toolbar to, uh, at the right end of that toolbar where you're working there are there are two the, lock buttons the, two the, lock. that one is the color lock okay so now if you change the stretch they'll if that one's locked then all the images will change their stretch together okay great you see i'm, I'm learning a lot from you as well so now if i do the color stretch and it's log and if i refresh Yep, here we go. That's exactly okay. Great. So, so this is something I didn't know that this one of those is just position lock and the other one is color lock, right? So this is the image alignment and this is the color lock. So thank you. Yeah, they used to be there used to be just one lock, but there was a lot of uh, um, there are a lot of use cases where people don't want them don't want them the same. So. Um, all right. Uh, so this is a relatively uh, straightforward. Uh, tutorial and displaying the, uh, um, the 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 aspects of the portal where you can actually look at the images and I think we're gonna probably work some more uh, we'll develop some more of those tutorials for you for the future uh, assemblies but uh, this is maybe a good time to stop uh, for a minute and ask whether anybody has any questions uh, I don't know if I can see the uh, any any chat windows but I think that there might be uh, Melissa, would you be kind enough to tell me if there are any questions? Uh... I think that the questions all got answered as we went. So I think there's no currently outstanding questions, but we could take more. And also I made a note that we should add, I think I missed adding the color lock to our actual tutorial steps. Um, That's right, it's not there. It's not there. So we'll add, get that added. It's normally locked by default. It's just uh, it got accidentally unlocked in uh, earlier in this uh, in this yeah, session. I must, have, I must have done it. And I apologize for that. So oh, okay, okay. Then we'll add an instruction to check that the color lock um, mm -hmm. before we proceed with telling people to do stretches and stuff. 
Right, but, but the, the point I want to make is that this is basically a, 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 an illustration of the fact that the um, the portal is really very much of a Swiss army knife. It contains a lot of really different tools. You've seen it from Melissa's presentation uh, two weeks ago that you can use it for plotting uh, things like seeing, plotting, of course, light curves and so on and so forth. But it also is a great way to display images, just depending on where you are and, uh, in the uh, 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 in in the uh, in in the selection of the of different efforts. So I don't know if uh, there is anything else that is not answered. And so maybe at this point I will uh, stop sharing and we can move on and continue with the uh, re revert back to the notebook aspect of the uh, um, of the uh, of the uh, of the Ruben Science platform. So uh, let me stop sharing and again I'm perfectly happy to. Um, take any questions. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Round of applause for Greg. Thank you. <laughs> of course, uh, Melissa should take all the credit because she developed the uh, uh, the tutorial to begin with. So, so this is really great. But, but thank you again. Sure. Only after Gregory told me how to use Dobstep. <laughs> Yeah, so a real team effort. Yeah, great, great uh, uh, round of applause to Gregory as well, who is quite essential in developing many of the uh, aspects of the uh, of the portal uh, in the Ruben Science platform. All right, so at this point, uh, back to you, Melissa. Yeah, okay, we'll pause for a couple of minutes, let you switch back to the notebook aspect. Um, Jeff Carlin's going to take over now. We're going to make some light curves. So we'll give you a moment to... Um, open the notebook aspect and open notebook 07B, which I will also give you a direct link to um, remind you how to grab it in case you wanna grab the file and upload it, um, just in case you're having notebook issues. So in this repo, grab notebook 07B. Um, only if you have to, most of you will have it in notebooks slash tutorial notebooks by default. So. I'm going to just share my screen for a second. Just to show you, so if you have notebook number two open and you're done with it, um, you can do like Douglas had done and restart the kernel and clear all the outputs to clear everything that you had done in the notebook. Um, and then to say, like to shut down both the notebook and shut down its kernel. So it's like a safe shutdown. For Jupyter Notebooks, you can go to the File tab and close and shut down Notebook. That'll completely shut it down, and you'll see it'll disappear, and the little green dot will have gone away next to Notebook 02. And then, Jeff, I'll let you take it over from here, starting up 7B. OK. Um, Find the right window. There we are. Okay, so do y'all see my notebook? Yes, I can see your screen. Maybe a little, um, maybe a little yeah. bigger. Oh, yeah, I can, I can give it a little zoom. Yeah. Oops. Oh, no, you, some of you may have been momentarily confused because um, Melissa was just showing her her. Uh, notebook aspect, and it looked a lot different than mine um, because I'm using dark mode. I hope hope uh, folks don't mind, but just so you know, in the settings, you can go and change if you like, if, if you prefer dark mode, you can change it here. So I can change it to black on white like that. Um, but if there are no major objections, I prefer it this way. Um, 
let me see. I was going to see if I can. Uh, okay, I can't see you. Also, um, if there are any questions or anything, just um, just feel free to speak up. Um, okay, so hopefully you've all had a chance to um, to get the notebook opened up, and you can follow along. Um, we're going to look at um, some variable stars. Uh, this is a capability that we didn't have in the DP 0.1 data release, but now we have um, the ability to extract and plot light curves for variable objects. Um, and so we're going to do that for some variable stars. And so this, um, this particular exercise starts with a, a known variable, because remember, it's a simulated data set, so we know which ones are variable. Um, but then we do a little bit at the end, if we have time, um, of my hacky attempts at um, discovering variables from the catalogs. And so this touches on a few of the of the data products. It uses the object table, the main object table, but then we use the forced source, which is for every object, um, we go and and say at this position, measure flux from every one of the visits that went into that coad. So that's what the forced source catalog is. Um, and we'll also use the um, the difference imaging, the DIA object and DIA source catalogs a little bit. Um, and then you'll see my um, probably slightly pathetic attempt at using the um, the long scar gold periodogram to um, to actually extract a period. Um, and I'm sure there are experts here who are much better at this, much more knowledgeable about this stuff than I am. So um, suggestions are welcome. But anyway, so the, um, we will start off as usual, just with some basic imports. And um, most of these are just NumPy plotting, um, a few AstroPy um, coordinate and time series objects. And then we need the, the tap service. We're going to use the tap service um, that Douglas demonstrated earlier to extract data. Um, and then you don't have to do this, but I always just do these, set up these defaults for plotting so that the plots look pretty. And in this case, we're also going to set up some color um, and separate colors and symbols for the U, G, R, I, Z, and Y bands. Um, and, and we're going to try and use these um, throughout most of our uh, tutorial notebooks so that you'll see a consistent color scheme. OK, so we, we, we get the tap service. Um, and now we're going to pick a star that we know is a simulated R Lyrae star. And so we have its position here. Um, and so we're going to look initially for this star in the object table, which remember is just a single table um, from the co-add, co-added images. Um, but we're going to look it up in the object table so that we can find its object ID. And then we can use that to actually pick its measurements out from each of the four source uh, measurements. OK, so with this next cell, we just, we just initialize that RA and deck position. Um, and then we're, oops, we're going to use, if I type correctly, we're going to just use a query like um, what you saw um, in the last hour in Douglas's uh, presentation. Um, and we're going to query around that RA and DEC position. So we use this where contains point um, and we, we use, if I can fit it on the screen here, there we go. Um, we use this known RA and DEC position. And then um, the, the trick I use here is to query a really tiny region. So this is um, one one thousandth of a degree um, so that you don't return a bunch of things you don't want. Um, we told it, don't give us more than 100,000 objects, but you'll see that that was totally unnecessary because that returned one object. Um, so this, we we hope, is our RR Lyrae star. Um, you can see you get it. You get its GRI magnitudes and, and many other things. 
Um, we also note here that this extendedness flag is zero for all of the three bands that we extracted. So it's most likely not extended, zero for false. So yay, it's a star. Um, it's around 18th magnitude. Okay, so now we wanna go take that information, that object ID that we just extracted um, here. So you can see the, the third column is the object ID. And so we'll use that object ID um, to identify this from the force source table. So we just uh, extract that into a variable selected object ID. And then now the, this query you can see is on catalogs.forcedSource. Um, and then it's joining uh, to the, um, the visit info table, uh, which we need to, to get the, um, the time of observation. Since we want a light curve, um, this visit info table has some, um, some information about you know, the conditions um, at each time a visit image was taken, um, the, the time at which it was taken and date um, and various other quantities. So we're gonna extract that. And so then we just join those two on the visit ID, but then we used at the end, we say where the object ID equals the object ID of that star we wanted to select. So this is sort of showing you how to combine a few pieces of information from different tables into one query. Um, so then we're gonna execute that. And this then extracts those results to a table and it says, says here, print the length of that table. There are 432 um, results, which is great. So here, let's uncomment this one just to see what that table looks like. Okay, now we have 432 results and you can see this um, has all of the bands that we queried. We did G, R, and I. Um, this has, so here it has your R band and your I band, um, et cetera, et cetera. And you have the fluxes and magnitudes in the table. So cool, we want to, we have that. Oh, I should also note, um, in addition, if I uh, scroll over a little bit, um, you can also see we need this midpoint MJD, which gives us the time for our time series that we want to plot. Um, so to select, since you noticed, since we noted that there's the R and the I band, that each band, um, all of the bands appear in this table. Um, just for convenience, this next step is just picking each band, um, sort of creating a flag, a Boolean flag that selects either the U, G, R, I, Z, or Y. So, um, so then you can just use this as a, um, as a flag on that sources array that we had to, to plot whichever band you want. So you can see here, we, then we just say sources, only give me the ones that pick our band. Um, and we're going to plot the time, the midpoint MJD, and we're going to plot PSF magnitude again for those R band measurements. Um, and voila, you see um, a lot of variation, almost a full magnitude of variation over, um, over this couple of years time. So it must be a variable star of some sort, but you can also see that um, with images taken only every, you know, few days or even few weeks, um, it's hard to see any periodicity in this. So I'll pause here just to see if anyone had any other, um, any questions or anything. Uh, I see. I see Tom's question in the chat. The um, the error bars. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, and in fact, Melissa and I just confirmed earlier today that 
that you can extract the errors. So, um, so uh, I think Melissa posted, in fact, the the way to extract an error um, in the chat a little bit ago. So, uh, yes, you can extract the errors um, by also using that same method that converts um, flux to magnitude in your in your query. So you could you could include that um, up here. Uh, as an additional line to extract the magnitude errors. I'll, um, I'll make exactly what it should be if you want to add it to the particular query here, and I'll post it in the chat in a second. I'll just test that it definitely works, and then I will post it in the chat. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Melissa. OK, so now what we want, um, of course, is um, I mean, this is great. We can be pretty sure this is a variable star. Um, but now we want to actually create a phased light curve. And again, this is, um, I, I noted here that the author of this notebook is not an expert in time series data analysis. So, um, so many of you may know more than I do about how to do this, but this is my attempt and it made me very happy that I was able to actually extract a period for this. Um, so just for convenience, I just extracted the, um, the time, the MJD uh, at midpoint and the magnitudes into their own arrays. Um, this is just sort of a convenience, um, not absolutely necessary. Um, but then we're gonna use this Lom Scargle periodogram, which you can go and read about. Um, there are links included here. Um, but basically it just returns the um, the contribution of the of the of any possible periodic signal at um, at different frequencies. And since um, since we know this is an R. Lyrae star, um, we know that their periods are usually between about 0.2 and 1 or 0.9 days. So we can actually limit our search over frequencies at, that are um, around that range. So in this case, we I, I put 0.05 and 1.05 days. Um, and then the frequency is, of course, one over that period. Um, and then we're just going to run this lump scargle algorithm from, from AstroPy, as implemented in AstroPy, um, with those minimum and maximum ranges. And it gave us back some array of the frequency and the power at each frequency. Um, and so um, if this was a really well-behaved, well-sampled um, light curve, then th there should be a peak at a, at a specific frequency that corresponds to the period of the star's variability. Um, and in our case, um, we're going to assume that we have a well-sampled light curve and that the, the frequency that has the highest power here corresponds to the real period of the star. Um, there in real life, that is not always true. There are complications. But in our case, we just loop over the the um the six different bands and say take the the peak for all six of them and then we'll just take a mean of that um, and that gives us a mean period of about half a day um, and this actually shows you the 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 peak um, frequency for each ugri z and y bands and you can see that they are all very similar so we must have a very nice well well sampled light curve um, and so now, you know, drum roll, please. Let's see if, well, before we do the drum roll, here's the, I'll show you that um, frequency distribution. And you can see, yes, there is a really nice peak um, in this band. And so this is just frequency, uh, power versus frequency or power versus um, period, which is just the inverse of that frequency. But then you can see that peak at 0.509 days. Okay, so then the next thing we do is we just adjust, we just adjust, um, we, we um, shift each observation to a uh, relative phase. So um, in this case, um, you just say basically uh, take some arbitrary initial time, T naught, and then we just take the difference between the time at each observation and that initial time and divide by the best period. And that will give you how many, or where you are in phase from uh, 
zero period. Um, and so we just use, so it's just a simple calculation of the phase. And now let's just plot what those light curves look like. So it'll be magnitude versus phase. And now here we are showing, uh, let me zoom out just a tiny bit. Okay. So here we're showing the light curve in all of the bands, U, G, R, I, Z, and Y, and they're all phased to the same relative initial time. Um, and so you can see that the phase actually, uh, you know, the peak is at a different, different phase for many of them, um, and that they don't, some of the bands vary together and some are kind of shifted relative to each other. And of course the amplitude is different, but this made me very happy that I was able to extract this uh, very nice light curve for, for all of these. Of course, this is a very well-behaved object chosen for example, but, um, but yay, we found an R Lyrae. We found its um, period uh, and we have a really nice light curve. So then we can just plot them all together to see what I was, what I was sort of mentioning, you know, how they, how they, uh, their relative amplitudes and, and their shifts um, look relative to each other. And so this is just the same six panels from above, just on a single plot. Um, but this is very good. It looks like a typical R. Lyrae star. Um, if you're not familiar, it's, it, it's really easy to go look this up, go Google. Google this, but um, you know you get this rapid um, rise to the peak, and then this sort of characteristic um, curve of an RR type A RR Lyrae star. Okay, so before we go on, I just, I'll pause for any any questions. And the next thing that we do is this is me really um, flailing around trying to pretend like a scientist and uh, and look for our Lyrae stars. But were there any questions really quick? They got answered. Awesome, okay. So yeah, so, so since we started previously with um, a known R. Lyrae star, um, it was it was easy to pick it out and plot its light curve and, and that was great. But um, if you were just, searching for our Lyrae stars, uh, how might you do that? Um, and this is only one possible way that you might do that. But, um, I, but the main purpose here is just to show you that you can use the data products from difference imaging. This is where um, you, we have uh, a deep coad template of the same sky area as a given visit and we subtract that template off and things, if something is varying, you'll have either positive or negative residuals relative to that template image. Um, and so we use this again, just like the, the main um, survey data products, you have the object and the source table. So the object is like essentially all of the source information smushed into a single object. Um, and then the source of course is, is each visit of it. And so, um, so there are various uh, quantities, um, and these I, I just sort of decided by playing around. And so this is a great opportunity to sort of, you know, maybe use this as a starting point and, and play around um, yourself with different parameters uh, to identify, you know, that help you identify things that vary. Um, and so there are things like this Stetson J statistic, which was designed to look for Cepheid variables. Um, basically large values of that suggest that the flux varied a lot. Um, and then I applied a few other things where I said, you, you can take the scatter in the flux um, being say more than 25% relative to the mean flux. Um, that suggests something is varying with time. Um, and then I just applied a few other cuts, which we won't get into because we don't have a ton of time. But, um, but these are of course not necessarily optimal. These are just what I chose. 
Um, but then you can see all of this list of criteria um, being implemented down here in the actual query. And so then you only return objects that satisfy those criteria. And I executed that and we'll see how long it takes. Okay, it finished. And then just below I printed, um, again, we extracted a source table, but the, in this case, it was the difference image sources, the DIA, DIA sources. And so the total length of that table is 540, 549 measurements, but the number of unique um, objects in there, which we find by doing this unique NumPy unique thing on the object ID, this says that there are 14 objects with 549 measurements of those 14 objects. So that's cool. Um, now let's see if we can figure out whether any of those are actually variables. Um, in this case, this um, I'll, I'll just breeze through this really quick, but this is just doing that long scargle thing that we did before, um, but it's just looping over them and doing it on all 14 of those objects. So we'll do that and it'll take a second to run. Um, and then we'll do that. And it does the same thing that we did before where you then take the best sort of best estimate of the, um, the peak power and you pick that frequency as your period and you then use that to create a phase and plot, plot light curves. And so then the last thing we do here is we just, again, we're just looping over those 14 objects that we, that we had um, and plotting each one in turn. Um, and so I'll just do that because we don't have a ton of time left today, but um, so this just shows you um, for each of those 14 object candidate objects, um, assuming the phase that that we, or sorry, the period that we extracted is correct, um, this shows you a phase light curve. So this is, looks like variable object of some sort, probably R Lyrie. I don't know if somebody else could correct me on that one. Has a period of one day. Um, this one, I don't know. Um, maybe that one's an interesting one. Um, that one, I don't know, but like uh, what I wanna show you is at least one of them was a successful identification of it, of an R. Lyrae star and its period. And so that shows a really nice light curve. Um, and you, you even see this little, little bump that you always see right before the rapid um, rise again. So this, this looks like we at least found one definite R. Lyrae star. Maybe here's another one. Um, here's a really nice one. Um, so uh, this one's a maybe. It looks like maybe the the period is a little bit off. This one, I don't know what happened. It has three low measurements. Nope. Curious what people might think that is. Um, but anyway, this is just to illustrate some ways that you might be able to go search. And so, so we just leave it with, by saying that um, you know there are a lot of other explorations that you could do. You could you could experiment with different ways to find variable stars, you know, based on those parameters that are in the the DIA object table. Um, you could experiment with different ways to identify periodic signals once you think you have a sample of variables, um, and then you could compare measurements in different catalogs for the same star. Um, and so I will stop there and take any questions if anyone has. Thanks, Jeff. Round of applause for Jeff. Yeah, awesome. And people can, you can use the raise hand function and we'll call on you if you have a question or you can post it in the chat or you can just unmute and start talking. And I did go kind of quickly through some parts of that. So, um, so there are definitely aspects of this that you might want to explore more on your own time, but, um, 
questions are definitely welcome. Yeah, we can, I think you mentioned it too, but Notebook 7a does basically the same thing, but for the for Type 1a supernovae, so the other kind of the only transient available in the simulation. Yeah, and actually, um, I'm glad you brought that up because also in Notebook 7a, there's a lot of there's there's sort of a lot more um, description of those various parameters that um, that were used here um to select candidates um so that that's also a good resource for um understanding what those parameters mean <laughs> that's a good question brian i did, um i don't think there's are there eclipsing binaries in the sample i don't actually remember i think it's just type 1a supernovae and three kinds of variable stars like oh i don't think eclipsing binaries were one of them but it could be a, I guess it could be a supernova that, no, I was going to say that if it was in the template image, then you get the negative. That's a good question. And also I'm surprised that it looks like, well, no, I guess not. I was going to say that it locked on a period, but that's probably just bogus. Just opening up the desk's DC2 paper to do a page search for eclipsing binaries, um, just to see. <laughs> nah, yeah, I don't think. No, I don't think eclipsing binaries were something that were simulated. So it's a no for Brian's question. Hmm. It is kind of, I guess it's kind of fun that at least something like that, that is not immediately understandable pops out because uh, that kind of illustrates just, you know, the fun and possibly frustration that will come from uh, digging through these data sets. Yeah, I can see a lot of people are asking about the truth data too, of course, which we anticipated. It's going to be a couple of weeks still before those truth data tables will be out. And even then after that, um, we'll have, we'll need a couple of weeks at least to make the notebooks and update our notebooks that deal with the truth summary data. So um, we'll make an announcement when the truth data is available. And then it'll be a couple of weeks after that where we'll have some notebooks to show you how to use it. Um, there's a very good question that I think went to a direct message to me, but the, um, but the, uh, um, the question is basically, is there a reason to use the, the difference image source catalog instead of, um, using the forced photometry? Um, and I think typically for, you know, for your, once you've used the difference imaging to find an object, I think you would typically then choose to use the forced source measurements to do your science. Um, and in fact, let me make sure, but um, I think that what I used here is in fact, yeah. Um, and so actually what these measurements are that um, in the object table, um, these are actually the, Am I doing that right? No, sorry, PS flux, PS flux, tote flux. That's what I was looking for here, sorry. It's here. Um, these total flux measurements, these are actually the, these are actually forced measurements on the individual visits. Um, and so there's the, there's a difference flux and then there's the total flux, which is on the original non-differenced image. And so that is actually what we're using. Um, and it would be an interesting exercise to take this and compare it directly to the forced source table for the same object and confirm that they um, they actually are getting the same measurements because I'm not actually positive whether they use this exact same algorithm for measurement. I mean, in, cr in crowded fields, um, you know, I think the, the difference imaging um, light curves will still be very useful. 
where it, it become, where it becomes quite difficult to do the, the force photometry, the ordinary force photometry accurately because things are so crowded, right? In a, in a difference image, things clean up quite a lot. So there's a scientific balance to make, um, and, you know, when you choose which, which approach is the, is the best for your particular use case. Yeah, yeah, good point. Oh, I think I see a raised hand, Jen. Hey there. Um, so can we make requests for different types of objects? So for instance, an EB sample, a bona fide one, can we ask that that be a part of the next uh, set of simulated data? Is it something that we can maybe even help out with? Um, yeah, what are our options with regard to, you know, requests and trying to vet, you know, the different types of objects that we see out there in the universe? <laughs> It's a good question. They, um, I, the these um, the DC two simulations are because it's simulating, you know, basically photons passing through the optical system all the way to you know final data products. The, um, uh, I guess I don't know what Desk's plans are for additional sort of data challenge simulations, but. Um, that is like many months of uh, computing that goes into it. So it's not trivial to just uh, to just include some new set of objects, but there are, um, yeah, but uh, there are possibilities, I think, to explore it, um, perhaps by injecting artificial sources into the data and testing recovery or things like that. Um, and I and I suppose um, if somebody is familiar with desks plans, future plans regarding additional um, simulations, I don't know if that's a possibility to include more things there. I don't think so because it takes a really long time to do these simulations, and we're going to have um, data preview. Data preview one will be the next thing, and even if desk made new simulations. There are no plans for um, us, for Rubin Observatory, to release more simulated data. We are doing DP 0.2, that's all that's in the plan for now, and then the next plan is to have real data. Um, and also I was thinking, and Tom brought up in the chat as well, that if you're looking for a, a larger variety of simulated just light curves that you just want to grab and use outside of DP0, then the plastic and elastic simulations, um, which are photometric classification data challenges, are probably going to be a little more useful to you. Um, I'll try and find some resources for plastic and elastic. Um, But yeah, and as Frosty says, yes, our next goal after this is just to give you real data, <laughs> which will have all the stuff in it that you need. So we have just a couple minutes left. Um, were there any questions about any of the, I guess any of the um, demos that we went through today? <laughs> Thanks for uh, you lobbed a softball, Douglas. Um, there, there, I, there are not currently. Well, there are some um, in the delegate contributions. There are some examples of injecting artificial sources into images um, and rerunning measurements. But um, we're working on a new tutorial that will do that. Um, 
sort of more robustly, let's say. So um, that's coming very soon. Yeah. Okay, what? it's it's right at 11. Um, so thanks everyone for coming today. Um, this was recorded and we'll post the recording. Um, yeah, see you at Stack Club next Friday or the next Delegate Assembly of the Friday after that. Thanks everybody, have a good day. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Okay, I'm going to end it for everyone.